You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 87, How to Raise Your Fees. In this week's episode, we discuss three different methods to figure out how to raise your fees this year and for years to come. Which way is best? We'll discuss it. Geeks Corner's back. We're going to be discussing cordless versus corded retraction. Are all these newfangled products that tell you you can get great retraction by just squirting something in the sulcus really effective? Or should you just stick to lassoing your preps with good old retraction cord? And we'll tell you in this week's product of the week which retraction cord we like the best. Is there one cord to rule them all? Find out this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by The Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, The Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Des Moines, Iowa this fall 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com right now to sign up for the next series. And welcome to this week's episode of the Dental Guys. I'm Wes the Dental Guy. And I'm John the Dental Guy. John, fresh off of the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics meeting, we it was our first introduction to this meeting. Yeah. I don't really think that we knew how great a time we would have had until yeah. we had gone. And we got to broadcast uh, live from uh, the Kettenbach booth, and we want to thank uh, them for uh, kind of giving us their booth to broadcast from and interview some amazing people um, mm-hmm. at the meeting. John, I think for me, um, this is going to be a repeat. Um, we talk about going to smaller meetings. We talk about going to regional meetings. Uh, what was going on in Chicago that uh, weekend was several different dental meetings, including the Chicago Midwinter. We happened to kind of focus our concentration on the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics meeting. Um, it's interesting because when we look at the size of this meeting, it's about a thousand strong. Okay. It is a general dentist and a prosthodontist meeting. Um, it's not exclusively prosthodontist. They encourage general dentists. In fact, I felt more welcome than any, than just about any meeting I've been to. And, um, I felt like that I was, uh, talking to a lot of people that really cared about doing high-level dentistry. They wanted to talk shop. They wanted to spend time at our booth. At, at first, it always takes a little bit of time to kind of, you know, help people to understand that, I guess, right. what we're doing what we're doing is cool and that we want to shed light on what they're doing. So we got to speak to all kinds of people. Plus, we got to hear some high-level speakers. And hopefully, in the future, we've made some connections we're going to bring some of those high-level speakers to actual shows um, yeah. and uh, record some great content. We've made some relationships there we feel like are going to go a long way. Yeah, and I think what I was impressed by with this meeting, you know, if you uh, if you are a subscriber to General Prosthetic Dentistry, mm-hmm. uh, for just like a literally a couple hundred dollars more, you can be a member of the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics you can get the annual meeting included and the subscription to the JPD. Um, And so really, when you think about what you're paying for this meeting, for what you get, it's very little uh, for the quality of speakers. And I think they bring in, you know, this quality because a lot of them, it's, it's kind of a, the prosthodontist, it's it's kind of a little guild, you know, that they've Mm -hmm. got Mm -hmm. with their people from residencies and academics and things like that. Um, that brings in the names because they they care about this stuff and uh, and yet it, it was it was the quality of, of bigger meetings we've been to but with a much more intimate feel uh, a lot of people know each other there you know because we've got people that have trained mm-hmm. and residencies together and things 
which was cool. And there were a lot of residents there as well presenting their research, was, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was a cool part of it. Uh, but I was really impressed with just the atmosphere there. You know, it was mm. definitely much more of a the feel of a family uh, there. But if you one of, one of the things we learned too. Uh, from the editor in chief of JPD, who was on the show, Dr. Stephen Rosenstiel, I, I was kind of, you know how we are. I mean, we're total geeks, and so when the guy who wrote the textbook "Fix Prosthodontics" is on the show, uh, that's kind of a big deal. So he was telling us one thing we didn't know, which is that the annual review of selected scientific literature, which we talk so much about on the show, is is open access now. They've paid. Mm so that anyone can have access to it. And the January edition of Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry is also free. So hey, if link you're looking, in the description down below, John, yeah. I'm gonna suit those links over to you so we can put them in the show notes. Yeah, we'll have those in the notes for you. So if you're interested in checking out the journal uh, or even just the annual review, which we think is one of the most useful pieces of literature, dental literature ever, that Open comes access. out every single year, uh, we think you should go check it out. And if you like what you're reading, I would definitely recommend that you uh, consider being a subscriber to JPD, uh, maybe even being a member of the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics yeah. based on what we saw, worth, worthwhile organization for sure. And besides just all that, Wes, I mean, I got to have my first time with some Chicago deep dish pizza. Uh, if you're not on our Instagram, yeah. you might want to scroll on over. Yeah, pull over the and, lawnmower. Yeah. Shut down the Wes, car. West, that's right. Pull over, <laughs> shut down. It's almost lawnmowing season again. I'm getting excited. Man, I got to mow uh, the grass. I yeah, can't it's, it. it's nasty out there, but I can't because it keeps raining. Mm. But if you if you pull over your lawnmower to the side right now, and you go to our Instagram and you look back to uh, end of February, you're gonna see a picture that West took of me in awe of my first ever Chicago deep dish pizza. And I mean, the way you framed it, it's really pretty sweet because. It looks like the pizza is like four times the size of my head, which, you know, I have a pretty big we got head, a, so it we takes got a, small a heck of a dish. pizza for that. We got a yeah, small we got deep a small, dish, guys. It's a small, I mean, it's, it's, out of, it's out of hand. And, I mean, I had always uh, wanted to go to Chicago. I just, I had been there once before for like a day. And mm -hmm. I just, I, I realized having gone there, I really need to spend more time there because we really didn't get a ton of time to just go sightseeing. Plus, it was cold as everything, mm -hmm. so... Definitely got enough of a taste of it that I'm going back. I'm excited about that because, uh, and I, I think, I don't know, man, with all the dental meetings going on, you almost need like a week up there to take it all in, man. Yeah, I think crazy. It's, there's, it's crazy how many meetings are going on up there at the time. The Chicago deep dish was one of the highlights of the weekend for us. It was for something sure. that we had planned for. And the for. steak at Gene and Giorgetti's. We had to go check that out. Oh, George and Giorgetti's, man. And, yeah. you know, we go up, we, we, pull, we go to this restaurant. Classic. Like, yeah. like red carpet. Yeah, the, old Italian the, the steakhouse paneling. from like the forties. Yeah, this the, our waiters like, you know, um, we ask him like, well, tell us about the cuts of meat you have. Well, he said, you know, you have the the marbled, the kind that's the ribeye. It's more taste, more flavorful. And then you yeah, got he's like, the, I don't know. I mean, we got yeah, some I mean, things. What, we got some meats. Got some, we got some. Got meats some meat. Here. I mean, what do you want? Yeah, this, what do you we want? Got this, we got this. I don't know. What's a garbage I mean, he salad? Was, he's like, well, you know what a garbage salad is? It's an Italian salad. It's a classic Italian. He was almost rude, but not rude. He was like, it was kind of like, I loved it. It, you ask him about the food. He's like, you know, we got food. It's good. I, I mean, what, you want some food or you want, you want to talk to me or you want to order some food and get some food? Hey, let and me I tell mean, you right just, now, if you want to listen great. to some good jazz music, okay? Oh, yeah. Man. Andy's, Andy's Jazz Club. Andy's yeah. Jazz Club. We actually I mean, went there two nights in a row. That's <laughs> we, how good it was. It was so good. <laughs> so much good jazz music. There was a guy that was playing, what, the B3 or whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he was blind. Tearing it up. Blind like, guy. Like, is that guy blind? He, and was, he was. I mean, he was awesome. tearing it up. He was tearing it up. Uh, we really it was a great. It. it was a great time. I mean, we had a great couple of great meetings. Got to mm. hang out in midwinter a little bit too, mm -hmm. and uh, saw the dental hacks over there. That was cool. You Got know, talked job. to them for a little mm -hmm. while. Saw some new stuff coming out which we'll cover in some mm -hmm. upcoming episodes we got some great some great show ideas from some stuff there so speaking of coming uh, up next week um, oh yeah yeah is the academy of osseo integration meeting stay tuned for some live recaps as oh, john yeah. and i journey to washington dc um not to see the president but to um you know uh, study a little bit more about dental implants as if we i mean we're always studying and uh, right. to hear what the latest, to see, greatest to is. To see the best of the best, man. The this best is the, of the best. best of the best. It's the meeting that sets the, 
the course for the rest of the year, the meeting of all meetings when it comes to osteo integration. Yep. It is the Academy of Osteo Integration meeting. We will be broadcasting from there. You'll stay tuned to our Facebook, our Instagram feed. We'll be posting pictures. Right. As You'll see it as our brain is exploding. Right. And we then will, we will bring it to you live then, uh, as we react to some of the things we hear. Like later on this month, we are traveling to Atlanta, Georgia. John, right. you're traveling with your team. I am traveling mono e mono to <sighs> take some courses myself. But you and I will be joining forces once again on the That's floor right. to do some special research of which we will not reveal. That's right. Um, but it is going to be an epic time for the next month or, month yeah, or so. Yeah, the Hinman meeting is what Man. we're talking about. Thomas yeah. B. Hinman. Thomas uh, B. Hinman. Regional meeting in the Southeast and uh, always a classic. Mm. Uh, they got a great exhibit hall. So we're going to be, yeah, we got, we're doing some, doing some research for the show as yep. well as for ourselves, but for the show. On top of uh, that, uh, you just finished teaching uh, the Restorative Driven Implants uh, Series 2. Uh, yep. You finished up uh, day two of Series 2 with some... Uh, prosthetic um, treatment planning and how tos yep. and hands on and uh, oh yeah it was a great yeah, day man it was uh, great times yeah in and Nashville which Nashville. is always which was great to be kind of close to us you know speaking I really enjoyed that. of restorative driven implants as I wear the shirt advertising on the show today oh look at that yeah well, uh, what a coincidence restorative driven implants is heading to Des Moines um, Iowa Des Moines Des Moines, yeah, Des Moines. I don't Des know Moines? how you say it, Adam. Adam Kruger, if you're listening yeah, to we'll this. Yeah, we'll have to have Brad. the Iowa guys give us a, some tips on that. <laughs> We're heading there this fall. If you're interested in signing up for a continuation, a continuation of uh, 60 hours of online and in-person CE, live surgical placement, guided and free-handed, John, it is the place to be for placing dental implants that are the most common things that you're going to see in your practice, immediate extraction, immediate placement, some healed ridge, some uh, simple full arch stuff that'll be presented there at that course. And hey, what we want you to take from it, you know, as we've said many times about restorative driven implants, and the reason we got involved with it is because we felt that there was a need to teach evidence-based and really a system, mm. a systematized way of thinking about dental implants from start to finish. We, we, there's lots of great courses out there. Uh, but what we found there was kind of a lack of the systematized approach, especially thinking from a restorative standpoint and that driving your placement. So hence the name restorative driven implants. We think you will come out of this course with a true system for your practice that will allow you to choose the cases that are real world, hmm. real world, not just uh, crazy stuff that you'd have to sedate your patients for, but real world every day cases that you can identify and treat um, through our system. So we really look forward to uh, to the great course in Iowa. We've got a great uh, grassroots group there that's looking forward to us being there. And and man, we're just meeting the other day about just how how this is expanding. It's just kind of crazy, Wes. I mean, yeah. it's been great to see the response, and I'm excited for Iowa. And, and as we go forward, uh, we got some some more dates and places that are we're going to be releasing here in the next little bit mm. uh, to tell you more about that. So stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. And Wes, today's show. Uh, today's show, let's take a quick break to hear from one of our sponsors and we'll get to the, the meat of the show because it's going to be a great show today. Let's take a quick break, hear from our sponsors. This is Justin Goodbrand. and here is today's tip. Now is the time to consider profit sharing to the 401k plan. If you have a 401k with profit sharing capabilities, then utilizing this feature can help reduce your personal taxes and add monetary benefit to your team. In a properly designed 401k plan, profit sharing can often leave you with a proportionally higher percentage of the profit share. So you may want to consider profit sharing if you've had a great year or are making some extra cash. However, talk with your CPA and your CFP to determine if this tip is right for you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, Wes, we're back and it's time to get into the meat of the show today. And this show is a little different from uh, some of the things. Now, we're going to get to some clinical stuff. Absolutely. Geeks, Geeks Corner coming up. Geeks Corner's coming, and the product of the week is coming. But I think this topic that we're going to speak about today, it's something that literally every single dentist, regardless of what kind of dentistry you do, 
it's a very important topic, and that is fees and how we set them and how we change them on a year-to-year -year basis because there's a, there's a ton of confusion about this. There's, you ask a dentist, how do you choose your fees and then how do you change them year to year? And you will literally get a different answer from almost every single one of them, don't you think, Wes? I mean, everybody's got their own little thing. Yeah, so I started from scratch, John, in 2004. And the question was, what do I charge? And yep. I can remember, I'm like, man, how do you even do this? And uh, I just kind of asked around and uh, my you know, obviously I was in residency at the time. And so I'm not going to, you know, I kind of had an idea of what we charged at the residency for things. And mm -hmm. so I kind of wrote some of those basic fees down, but you know, it takes a little bit of work to be able to come up with a good fee for, um, what you should charge. Mm -hmm. And you really can't go <clears throat> around and just ask people. You really are not supposed to do that, right? You're right. not supposed that's to not act. Supposed to, yeah, that's not supposed to be how you, how you set your fees. Yeah. Right. You're not supposed Collusions, to go. Collusions, what they call that. Yeah. You're not supposed to go, okay, so, hey, let's go to the study club and say, hey, for just a few minutes right before we get started, what's everybody charging for an 0150? Right. Like, you can't do that. Right. Uh, that is called collusion, and that is right. against the law. Or calling up a buddy and says, hey, can you email me all your fees? Just print them off of EagleSoft, Dentrix, SoftDent, whatever. Can you just send that over my way? You can't do that. And right. so how do you legitimately set fees? Well, you, you can do it three different ways, and we're going to talk about those three ways to do that today on the show. I think for any dentist, it's important to always reevaluate your fees. And mm. John and I always around this time of year, even prior to the end of year, start looking at our fees and how we're reimbursed and what our overhead is for particular things and making adjustments and so on. So John, let's talk about these three things. Yeah. So if you, if you want to get an outline of this, you know, there's, there's three ways, as Wes said, to set your fees. One is just arbitrary. You know, you, you look at your current fees and you say, well, I kind of feel like I need to raise my fees 2% this year. Or I look at an individual fee and I just feel like, oh, my lab fee went up a little bit on my crowns. So I'm just going to arbitrarily raise my fees. Or you might even say alternatively, well, insurance isn't paying any more this year for a profi. So I'm just going to leave my fees the same because 90% of my practice is insurance, for instance. So one way is just arbitrary. The next way is to have some guidance and still do it yourself, but have some guidance. And the, the way we're going to talk about doing that is by things like the National Dental Advisory Service, but you can also get that information from local reps. Uh, a lot of uh, product reps, say Patterson, Shine, those types of companies will do fee analysis for you, as will uh, certain accountants, things like that. And the third way to do it is kind of a fully guided approach, if you will, where you have someone who will look very, very in-depth into your fees, uh, insurance reimbursement for fees, uh, talk about your area, talk about uh, where you want to grow your practice the most, what you like doing the most, uh, and determine kind of what your percentile is that you should be in in the fee range, and then help you set the fees. And there are a couple of companies that do that for you. Um, the one I think Wes and I are most comfortable with, or not, I shouldn't say comfortable with, that's the wrong word, but the most familiar with is Charles, Charles Blair, uh, who uh, has a, a, I think it's called Practice Booster, and he does a fee analysis, uh, but it's a much more in-depth type of thing where he's actually going into all of those kind of metrics of your practice and also talking about uh, more than that. So, so we'll, we'll get more into that. Let's, let's start with that first one, though, Wes. This, the idea of just kind of arbitrary uh, setting of fees. You know, I think a lot of people do that. I think we, we kind of, I, I don't want to make that sound like it's a joke or something. I think there's a ton of people who just arbitrarily say, well, I'm kind of feeling like I need to charge a little more for this or that. And that's just how they, that's how they do it. Yeah. They, the, probably it's easier now to kind of do those things because the internet has, um, 
refined, you know, what we know about what everybody charges for a particular code. Right. Because if you type in, you know, what's the typical fee for an 0150, you know, you're going to get a myriad of answers, you know, for mm -hmm. what that is. And, you know, one way you can start figuring this stuff out on your own is when you submit to an insurance company, you're going to see what they allow if you're in network and so right. or even out of network and it pays different whether you're in or out so you kind of have to like look at that and like make a judgment call on what you're willing to accept one as if you're in network as a write-off mm -hmm. um, number two um, if you look at that and you're saying well I'm not in network. What are they paying me, you know, mm -hmm. um, for the reimbursement? So if you submit a hundred dollars and they're paying you 79, are you high? That's a right. great question. Or is their reimbursement low? And, and one of the, one of the ways that I think if you, if you don't want to spend any money <clears throat> and you do want to do this all kind of on your own, but not have to spend any money, I do want to mention a resource here that if you're, because we're going to get into a couple ways you can do this where you got to spend a few dollars. But if you really want to do this for no money, there is a website mm -hmm. and it is fairhealthconsumer.org, fairhealthconsumer.org. And that is a website that is put together by the insurance industry as well as the government. And basically what this is, is it's a, uh, an estimator that comes out of, uh, I think they say it's like, Two billion uh, private healthcare claims, or something like that, uh, and and I think it goes up even higher for the medical side. And what you can do is you can go in there and you can enter your zip code, and you can enter in dental codes, CDT codes, and it will tell you what the average cost is based upon the insurance submitted amounts. And I have found this to be very accurate uh, for my area versus even some of the others that I've seen. So, but the problem is with this thing, Wes, it takes forever. If you want to go in there and you want to enter a fee, you got to go through this whole little process. It takes, mm -hmm. you know, a couple minutes per, per code. And I think they limit you based on your IP address to only maybe 10 codes you can do. And then you have to maybe use somebody else's computer or something right. like that. So they don't make it easy for you to use this because they don't want them. They're not really looking for dental offices to use this. They want this to be for consumers but I will say it is it is something you could use. But I think most people, though, they're just saying kind of arbitrarily, like you said, you don't know if it's a high or low fee based on your insurance reimbursement mm -hmm. or whatever. You're just kind of guessing. And I don't think that's a good way to go. I think Fair Health Consumers is a next step up. But I think we should spend the most time, Wes, on the two other ways of going. One yeah, being, and I'll say this about Fair Health Consumer is yeah, that yeah. When, you, when you get on there and you search for fees – most of the time, the information is about two years outdated. So, sure, like it'll sure. say, it like older. based on 2017 data, you right. know, and it's 2019, you know, so it's a couple years out of date. But uh, so let's get into the more structured way yeah. to do fee yeah. analysis. One way that I've been doing it since the very beginning is using a product um, from um, Wiserman. Um, uh, medical and dental, and basically it's the National Dental Advisory Service Fee Report Book. Yes, NDAS, okay? And we put the link in the description for 2019s in the show notes below, and uh, it's $129. I used to think, man, that's a lot of money for a list of fees, but we're talking about the one of the most comprehensive mm -hmm. books to compare fees. Now, here's the interesting thing. We're comparing fees based on zip codes. Right. And so this is where this book gets interesting. And so essentially the way the book works is you look up your zip code, it gives you a multiplier, and basically you take that multiplier, like for instance, my multiplier is like 0.91, and the people that are in your zip code, or maybe you have multiple zip codes, so you take like an average of that multiplier and you multiply it. So if your multiplier was 0.91, you multiply that by the fee, and then that's your fee, and you set your fee based on that. Now, what John and I found, for the most common fees, this book is pretty 
pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, however, however, for fees that aren't utilized or reported as much, this book is is, is not as it's accurate. It's not as accurate. Right. Yeah, a it lot of times it's over. We find it's overpriced or oh, the fees are higher right. than what I think most people are actually charging for procedures that are not super common. Like for instance, uh, bone graft at time of implant placement. Yeah. You know, we were high. seeing fees in there that were twice what Combing. anybody in our area that we know about uh, charges. So, you know, you just have to realize that there yeah. are some limitations to it, but, but for probably 90% of the codes that we use, uh, it's really right on. And it gives yeah. you what's up, what, I, what I love about it. I mean, what Wes said is of course, what I love about it most that you can look by your zip. But I, what I love, maybe even more than that, is it gives you a percentile. So you can mm -hmm. say, all right, I feel like my dentistry is in the 50th percentile. Now in other explain, words, hold on just a minute, because you just yeah. went over my head, okay? <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you're, so you're saying you have to decide what percentile you feel you should be in as far as the fees well, that you John, charge. Well, so, John, I mean, when I took my CTBS test... Oh man. In grade school, yeah. I wanted to be in the top percentile. Right. So if you are feel like you should be in the 90th percentile, right. then you can be in the 90th percentile, West. You can say all my fees, I'm I'm 90, I'm high 90s, you know. Right. But depending on your practice and the area that you practice in, uh in terms of your uh, maybe the materials that you use, the mm -hmm. lab that you use, um I don't know if you want to judge yourself as a human being, you know, I mean, say, well, I'm kind of a sucky dentist, so I'm going right. to be in the 20th percentile, but you can, but I love that because it gives you percentiles because it's hard to say, like if they just said the fee recommended for a crown is a thousand dollars, but you didn't know how much of a standard deviation there was between 50th and 90th. I mean, what if, what if a 50th percentile crown is 945 and a, 90th percentile is 960, you know, so there's not really that right. much difference. But in some of these fees, there's a huge difference between the low and the high percentiles. And you have to decide where you feel like you belong with your patients. And, 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 and we'll get into a little bit more fee philosophy toward the end of this, because I have some comments on that, on how to set your percentile. But I think that that NDAS uh, or if you want to go to Patterson or those types shine, they, they sell these. They sell the same kind of data, um, but based, my understanding is, on the same basic information from uh, mm. NDAS and the ADA. Mm -hmm. And I think those are a good place to start if you want to do, and you're still comfortable with, because you still got to go in and enter those in, mm -hmm. and you still have to decide if you want everything to be the same percentile. And I think that's one of the things that's a little bit more challenging to do, is if you look at these fees, you go, well, should I have everything in the same percentile? Mm. Maybe yes, maybe no. That's where this third way of doing it, Wes, comes into play. So yeah. if you if you wanted to use uh, Charles Blair's service or another, there's a, he's not the only one, but if you wanted to use his service or one like his, the difference between this and, and, and the way I've handled this, just to kind of preface this, what I do is every third year, and I've just chosen that arbitrarily, every third year when I'm setting fees is I will have Charles Blair's company do a practice fee analysis. It's not that expensive. It's a few hundred dollars. And so, yeah, that's their revenue enhancement service, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So you you pay them a few hundred bucks, and, what, and you give them a copy of your fee schedule, which has the number of times you've done procedures plus your fees. And they dive into that, and they look at basically how much revenue you could make if you raise your fees by their recommended amounts. They look at all the zip code data, the insurance data. And then you have about a one hour, I believe it is, phone consultation mm -hmm. with him. And he gets on there and he pretty much gives you a, a summary of your practice, what he thinks about it, what he thinks you're doing right as far as coding, some common problems offices have with coding, mm -hmm. um, where he thinks you could maybe do coding a little differently to maximize reimbursement in a legal way. And then talks a little bit about fees and percentiles because he'll kind of, he'll, he gives you percentiles as well, but he kind of tries to gauge your office and where you need to be with your percentiles. And that was helpful for me because, you know, percentile things kind of hard to answer sometimes. I mean, you can arbitrarily say, I feel like I'm 
you know, Wes Mullins and I'm 99. You yeah. know, you could <laughs> you can always say that. But if you're not sure where you need to be, sometimes having someone look at your practice, and ask you some questions uh, about about what you do might help you to put yourself in the right percentile. And he will talk about how some fees he will put in different percentiles for different offices depending on what they like to do, mm-hmm. which is interesting, right? Because you might hate dentures. So if you hate dentures, maybe you should have dentures, the denture fee be higher. For instance, you know, yeah. because when you do a denture, it takes you four try-ins, you know, or, or whatever. And listen, it, that's you, one way to slow down the growth of a particular area is just raise the fees. Yeah. It just raise yeah. them up, raise them up. You know, you want to yeah, slow down the growth, raise the fees. So that was an interesting thought, you know, about that. Cause I, I think, um, well, Wes, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you, what do you think on that versus the NDAS thing? And I don't, and let's talk about like kind of philosophy on fees a little bit. Cause I think people are interested uh, in that. So, I mean, I like, I like, you know, the consultation. I like the, the advice. Um, mm-hmm. and I like that it comes from a dental professional. Um, I feel like that, you know, even my accountant, as much as he's really good at mm-hmm. fee analysis, I like this better. Um, mm. Not because he's not good, but it, it's just that this gives me a little more insight, it seems like, on the specifics yeah. of what, you know, what kind of practice I have and what yeah. and how I'm growing and I mean, he's looking at it from a different perspective, whereas the accountant's looking at it from a true, like, maybe return, you know? Right. And, right. He, you know, there are, there is part of it is return, right? But another right. part of this is, like, you know, you have to look at, like, a global, what are you trying to do in your culture? Um, one thing that, that we did a couple years ago was we hired uh, Unlock the PPO, which is another mm-hmm. type of, of company that does a more in-depth dive into fee analysis, but they also look at your insurance and mm-hmm. they dive into that. And I, and I think he has some of the things, same things too. And, and obviously the cost starts going up the more detail they start looking uh, right. into your practice. But, um, but yeah, I think like, for instance, one of the things that I've gotten from Charles Blair a few years ago, gosh, probably seven or eight years ago, he, he, we were on the phone with him and he said, well, I see you're not using the palliative code. Yeah. And we were like, well, why would we use that? And he said, well, because insurance reimburses it so much better uh, than limited evaluation for many patients. When you do, obviously you have to do what the code says, right? But sometimes we would say, have a patient come in that needed a uh, temporary filling because a tooth had broken mm. and they were in pain, sensitivity, Right. So we would put a temporary filling in, but we would not charge the patient oftentimes, and we would charge them for a limited evaluation just because that we didn't know any better. Right, but then what and, you just did was you just burnt them an exam on the year. Yeah, you burnt one of their periodic exams, exactly, because now the insurance is not going to pay for one. And then also you got reimbursed at whatever the level of limited evaluation was. Well, you can charge more for palliative because you did something, and reimbursement rate is much higher oftentimes, and you don't burn... A periodic exam. So, so that was just why a one... dental professional, okay, yeah. doing yeah. this is is interesting. Yeah. Because every year the American Dental Association comes out with a new code book, and it's always mm-hmm. refined. There's always something new in it. There's always something subtracted, and right. there's always something changed. And when they change that, the insurance companies start to follow in that change. So like for instance, in 2019, they did away with the occlusal guard by report. Now you have occlusal guard hard, occlusal guard soft. I don't know. There's like three now. So, you know, Charles Blair or somebody like Sandy at Unlock the PPO, they are looking at this stuff like crazy. They're going to know reimbursements. They might not know exactly what to tell you to do, but they're at least are going to have some dental IQ. Right. Right. that actually helps you make a decision dentally as an owner. Now, John, okay, we just talked, I just mentioned something. As a owner, you're making decisions, okay? So mm. let's go into that philosophy here. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, John, who makes the decisions in your practice? How much, how many times a year do you raise it one time a year, one time every other year? What's the philosophy for dental fees and who's making those decisions? Yeah, and I think, well, for me, it's definitely me, you know, uh, that's, that's, you know, but, but I think you need somebody to make that decision who is comfortable with, uh, with raising fees. You know, I think that sounds simple, mm -hmm. but I think many people uh, in dentistry, many dentists and uh, uh, people that are in, in the helping world uh, of, of healthcare um, mm -hmm. also have a bleeding heart. Uh, and they have this desire to not make patients leave. They want to make people happy, and they think if they raise their fees uh, too much or too often, that patients will leave the practice. And uh, you know, Charles Blair talks a lot about that. He talks about how it's such a common thing that he comes into these practices as a consultant who haven't raised their fees in ten years or five years, Man. and talks about how. You know they're they're twenty percent, thirty percent, fifty percent below uh, where they should be, and the thing he talks about is the amount of money that you lose, and it's not just him. I mean, you can read McGill and McGill Advisory, Collier and Associates, these newsletters, these dental finance newsletters. It'll talk about calculating how much money you lose, and how many patients you would have to lose in order to even get close to the amount of money that you lose by not raising your fees. And it's really kind of uh, amazing how much, how much difference is. And I think the philosophy side of it is, Wes, um, number one, patients will never want to pay what you're charging. Mm. If, if they are fee conscious, if a crown costs $100, it would be too much money. If it costs $500, too much money. And I think that's something that I had to really learn early on is instead of feeling guilty of your fees, that you should feel proud of your fees because they reflect the service, the type of quality of service that you provide. And that comes right out of a book that I read years ago called Tough Questions, Great Answers, which is a dental book about that, that very question. Uh, now, as far as how the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts of how much do you raise your fee? Um, what do I go to from that? I, now, I use same things, NDAS, absolutely. Charles Blair, absolutely. But I also look at some of these um, dental newsletters like McGill Advisory. I really am a, I've been a follower of theirs for a long time. I think they do a good job. And each year at the end of the year, they talk about that. They talk about what? Consumer price index, which is yeah. interesting. So every year, you know, inflation changes. The, the price of goods changes. And they will kind of talk about that. They'll, they'll say, well, the CPI this year was 2%, 3%, whatever. And then they'll talk about that, uh, say, uh, when the medical device tax came up and we started to see labs having to charge more because they were getting charged more for certain products that are considered medical devices. And they'll give you kind of a recommendation on what percentage they think that, they sh that you should raise your fees. This year, for instance, it was 5%. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then some years it's 2 to 3%. It just depends on the economy and on CPI and those types of things. But, you know, I, I, I don't know, Wes, do you think that people struggle with raising their fees because they feel guilty or there's a fear behind that? What, what do you think's going on with that? I think it's the fear of actually losing patience. I think it's the fear of really not knowing what you should do. Um, I don't know that we don't, we don't, we should be doing this analysis yearly. Okay. First of all, one, yeah. how often should you do it? You should do it yearly. Uh, if not... Um, reviewing it um, even mid-year a little bit. Um, some of the fees I feel like have to be reviewed a little bit more frequently than yearly. Just talked about those are some things as we see reimbursement change um, for for certain insurances. Um, there's there's no rhyme or rule of when you can or cannot raise fees. You can raise fees anytime you want to. You know you mm -hmm. can decrease your fees anytime you want to. You can do a discount anytime you want to. We're not ruled or governed by you know, what we have to do unless you're signed on to a exclusive, you know, contract. 
Um, but as a general rule of thumb, you can do what you want to do. I think fees, one, need to be reviewed at least annually. I think that um, the fear is, and my fear early on in my career, as I was advised every year to raise my fees a certain percentage based on CPI, um, Consumer Price Index, that patients would notice. And the truth of the matter is... They just didn't notice. Now, there are people that, I'll tell you who notices. It's the person that has the crown done this year, and they have another crown that was done maybe five to ten years later, and they're like, man, has it ever went up? And But that's actually easier <laughs> because things do increase in cost. Right. Um, you know, I, I also remember, too, that the first time that I it really got into placing dental implants, okay, because this is some high-dollar um, medical devices here we're buying. And I remember getting the fee increase sheet for the next year, okay? Mm -hmm. And it was something like 10% that they mm. raised their fees. And my office manager's like, well, we should raise our fees 10% on dental implants. And I was like, are you serious? That would be in like $180. Yeah. And and so that's how I felt. I felt like that would be like $180. Yeah. And she said, but they did. And you're going to pay that. Right. You know, why would not your patient pay for it? So we actually have that feeling. So one, yes, you should raise your fees. Yeah. Um, and two, will you feel bad about it? Maybe, maybe not. Um, depends on the yeah, kind depends of person. Depends on your personality. Depends yeah, on the kind of person you are. I, yeah. I, I honestly, I give away a lot of dentistry in my community, amongst my patients, and abroad, and locally, and our, many dentists are doing that, and that is one thing that our profession has always done really well, I think it seems like, inside their practice, given where it is yeah. due. And, and one so of the things about, about fees that I, I hear sometimes as an objection to raising fees and it's from the practices that are very insurance based and yeah. what they'll say is well it doesn't make any difference anyway because what i'm getting reimbursed is capped by the insurance company and i'll See, tell that's you that's a problem you don't understand because when you submit your fees to the yep. insurance company say say you're in contract with delta and delta pays you eight hundred dollars or whatever say they pay eight hundred dollars well you still should submit your full fee. And when your fee goes up by 5%, if enough dentists uh, submit a fee that is $1,200, $1,300, whatever, mm -hmm. then over time, at least the theory is, right, that the insurance company should react to that by seeing trends in the marketplace and, and raise their reimbursement. Now, it doesn't always happen. We can't, we can't no. count on that. And it some insurance companies will just sit there and, and keep their fees the same because they feel they can. But don't fall into the trap that, oh, I don't, I, there's no value in me raising my fees because I'm an insurance-based practice. There's huge value in that as a profession uh, to, to be able to get the, and you need to know, you need to know what you're really writing off. Because if your fee was in the right percentile and, and it turns out you're writing off five hundred dollars a crown for what your fee should be instead of one hundred dollars it may make you reevaluate your participation with that insurance provider so don't let insurance hold you back from you know finding out what you really should be charging and the thing that really messes with you that really messes with you wes is when you go out to spear for instance and they talk about dentistry uh with insurance and they mm -hmm. show you uh write-offs and they show you well how many fee for service crowns do you have to do in order to to equal out a number of insurance crowns so this again is a if the great reimbursement... leap of faith that yeah, you have to yeah. take and so so it, it starts oh, to disturb you it does start to disturb you the, the the thing that i think we're talking about here is the usual customary and reasonable mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. and to be honest with you doctors should be setting what usual and customary and reasonable is because doctors are paying the overhead for their right. practice right you're paying the light bill you're paying the rent you're paying all of the insurance you're paying all those things that it takes to run your small business 
Okay. Right. Now, the interesting thing here is that health insurers determine what they deem as usual, right. customary, and reasonable. And so, therefore, they pay at a certain percentage of whatever they think is appropriate, not based on yours, not based right. on your overhead, based on their overhead and their profitability. So, so all we can do is we can just submit what we think our fees should be and hope that the insurance companies listen. Or you can get out of insurance, you know? I, and, and honestly, that's a decision I think that's the thing we all have to make. Is that I, I, I kind of get upset a little bit whenever people talk about like, Man, re insurance reimbursement's terrible and I can't get out of it. My patients won't come to me. I just disagree mm. with that. Move somewhere, move somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, and that's another show. That's another that's, show. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> conversation, <laughs> but, we, but we'll digress. So I think, but, okay. but hopefully that gives you guys a little idea yeah, links of how in the, the show dental dip, guys show description are, are, right here below. I send them all the text over here to John. Yeah, and, yeah, it gives you some resources for how the dental guys set our fees and go check some of these things out. See if they're useful for you. I, I you might be surprised that your fees are much lower uh, than what you think, uh, or, or much much lower than what they should be. Uh, and and trust me, no matter how afraid you might be to raise your fees. Um, the amount of money that you're going to make over your career compared to being afraid mm. of raising your fees, I mean, pay, get paid what you should be getting paid. That's the way I look at this. We work hard. If you do work hard, if you do a good job, uh, you deserve to, to make a good living. And I don't think we should ever feel bad about that. And I think our team should also understand the rationale behind our fees because we want to be able to pay them more too. And they need to understand that when we raise fees, it's not just about us, but it's about the entire business growing and our team growing. So, all right, that's enough about that. Let's move on to the Geeks Corner. Geeks Works. Corner. Geek Geeks it out. Corner's Let back. me just tell you, how much tissue retraction is required for your impression material to enter the sulcus and create a reliable thin of impression material in a sulcus so that your lab can truly trim a dye and you can have true ch tissue retraction and there'll be no doubt, no doubt when they pour your dye or when you pour it, that you can see your margin and it is crisp, like sharp, like turn mm. up the magnification. You don't even have to look at it under magnification. It's like, well, that's easy. And you just like flake away the excess stone, and there's your margin. I remember in preclinical lab and in, 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 in dental school, we had an instructor. His name was Victor Wallach, and he was from Boston. So it was Boston. Wallach. My name's Boyston. Victor Wallach. And Wallach, would, he would say, Doc, I want, you, I want you to get, make such a fine impression that my dog could make the crown. My dog. <laughs> so... The idea being that you know we need to we need to have such a, a readable impression that it's there's no question. Yep. So I think we should start of the impressions actually sent to the lab that had problems. So eighty percent had some. Eighty percent had some problems, but fifty of the eighty percent that had problems had tissue of the margin. Right. Okay? Critical error. Critical error. Critical error. So how do you how did they make the crowns with right. tissue of the margin? It. Faked it. Faked it. That's what they did. They faked it. So let's so, start with what is the bare minimum, the BAM, the right. bare minimum for what we need, Wes. What, and, we, and we didn't really know this. The dental guys did not know when we saw the study come so, out. So the study we're going to reference today comes from the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry, as you might uh, imagine. And it's from February, and it's entitled Comparison of Four Cordless Gingival Displacement Systems, Whoa. a clinical study. But before we get into the study, yeah. the question we wanted to know, the answer to, Wes, we didn't know, was how much minimum retraction do you need to get impression material to accurately, or to or enough impression material down in the sulcus? What was it? We could really geek out on this, but we're just going to say right now that definitively you need at least a bare minimum of 200 microns. Now, in order to achieve that with certain products, it required certain different circumstances. We'll get into that just in a second. But you need 200 microns at a bare minimum. That's the minimum. Now, if you're using some knockoff impression material, John, do you know the tear strength 
of that mm. impression material. Do you know how well it works at 200 microns around the sulcus? So let's say I create the bare minimum, right? bare minimum sulcus of 200 microns, and I'm using whatever impression material, will it work at 200 microns? Well, you need to ask the manufacturer that. Right. You need to ask your rep that. You don't need to ask the dental lab. Please don't go ask the dental lab guy yeah. your question about your impression material. Go straight right. to the source because they don't know. You need to be know. the expert on you this. You need to be yeah. the expert, right? So there's all kinds of ways to do tissue retraction, okay? Right. There's all kinds of ways. We know the most tried and true way to, to provide adequate minimum, if not greater than the minimum, it will actually will create greater than the minimum tissue retraction is double cord technique. It is the gold standard. John, explain the double cord technique. Yeah, so we've covered this on some shows before because it is the technique of choice uh, really overall. It's the technique uh, of choice of the dental guys. It is. It is. It's the best. And uh, now there's other techniques we'll get into, but it's it's the best. Basically, what you do with the double cord technique is you place a small cord into the sulcus first. And then when you've completed your preparation, because many times the first small cord goes in before you complete your pre preparation. Then when you complete your preparation, you place the second larger cord uh, into the sulcus. And when you are taking the impression, you pull only the large cord out, leaving behind the small cord, which is still displaced into the sulcus. So the small cord basically controls bleeding. The large cord does some hemostasis, but mainly is the, the true retraction cord. So now that timing is everything, is, John, right? Because right, there was right. a study that said that if you did the double cord technique and you said, well, I only need two minutes with the second cord in, it showed that you did not achieve the 200 microns long enough mm -hmm. to provide true tissue retraction. In fact, yeah, it collapsed, collapsed so within, fast that you yeah. couldn't get your impression material in there. Okay, right. Study so over. time matters too. So even right. if you have double cord technique, you've got to leave that second cord in. The bare minimum for, amount of time and the maximum amount of time would be four minutes. Uh, you yep. no longer than no longer than four is necessary. Four minutes yep. on that second cord. Yep. We also know that there are other tried and true ways, um, but cost can start to roll into this, okay? The second would be most tried and true, I believe, would be laser or electrosurge uh, troughing around yep. the margin. And we know from a study that uh, we recently looked at that it provided anywhere between 450 and 500 microns of tissue tr retraction, actually yep. tissue ablation, um, right. around the crown margin. And so, therefore, was adequate enough to achieve excellent uh, results um, as far as uh, retraction. But, however, you don't want to be ablating tissue in the anterior. So, this is a thing, you know, you all know that uh, John and I, we utilize electrocautery and uh, diode lasers in our practice. And we don't use those on an everyday um I guess we don't, we don't, we use them every day, but we don't use them in certain areas of the mouth. Let's just put it that way. Exactly. Like, exactly. Right. And, um, so John, tell us about this actual study that we're referencing to that got us on this kick of tissue retraction. Yeah. You know, for years there have been products out there that are advertised as being alternatives to these techniques that are proven. So we've got, uh, things that you can inject into the sulcus that are designed or advertised to create tissue retraction and hemostasis. And this is a great study which actually compared these cordless gingival displacement systems to one another. And basically what the study was is that they, uh, they used uh, four different products and they uh, uh, used that these were on patients um, in, uh, in a real, in the real world. And then, uh, they dried the teeth, they got a digital scan, uh, and then they would place the different types of, uh, retraction techniques, pastes and things like that, uh, in, and then, uh, they would measure, uh, how much change there was, uh, in the, uh, in the, re in retraction horizontally, and vertically. uh, and vertically. So they were using a digital scanner uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to look at differences in the gingival position in microns. Now, one 
potential issue with that is the accuracy of the scanner. Okay, so there is some potential inaccuracy there, maybe. Uh, some other studies have used, uh, you know, models to, to measure this, um, you know, which, which, you know, again, there may be some, even some, some uh, potential uh, problems there. But bottom line is they used the scanner, they measured it between these. And what the products that they measured or that they tested were Traxident, Exposil, Exposen, and the 3M retraction product. And just to give you kind of the, the bottom line is that they found that from a vertical and horizontal, as they're measuring both, um, that uh, they're, again, assuming that the minimum is 200 microns, uh, Traxident did not meet any of the minimums. Uh, Exposil did uh, on the horizontal, as did Exposen and the 3M retraction. Uh, the best one in this study was Exposen, which uh, in, from a horizontal. They all struggled vertically. They all struggled vertically. Uh, the study said that that was not as important, which is probably true, uh, to get as much impression material down vertically as it is horizontally. Um, but these products did show adequacy. The problem with the study in, in a couple of ways, number one, we don't know anything about time. They did not study how long they held, held the retraction. And they did not have really a good control. They didn't have uh, cord, which was surprising to me, or laser, or electrosurge, or something that's considered to be one of the kind of the gold standard tests. So they did find, you know, clearly that one of those Traxident just wasn't going to work. Uh, and but the others, um, they said it exceeded the 200 micron requirement for horizontal displacement, and they found that it didn't change anything with the periodontal. Uh, health over the next couple of weeks on really any of them. So I don't know, Wes. I mean, to me, this was kind of a mixed bag on the study because it did show that you can get some hemostatic and, or I'm sorry, some uh, uh, displacement, some gingival displacement along with hemostasis with these. But I, I guess I really would have liked to have seen a control with cord. I really would have liked to have seen some discussion on uh, how long because I right. think that's one thing. I've tried these products and we'll talk about your experience too. I've tried them and I really like the hemostatic mm. uh, part of these products. I think, I think it's awesome. I've used them uh, just in addition to cord before I was using Viscostat or, or just kind of playing with them in addition to cord, uh, especially Traxident because it's a hemostatic and it works great as a drying agent and a hemostatic agent, but I, I really never relied on it for retraction. Um, and I think that uh, there's a lot of people out there that are using these things solely for retraction. And I, I guess I worry a little bit about that, although I will say I was surprised. Mm. I was surprised that you did get a, a fairly large amount of retraction, more than I would have expected. But it's hard to say that when you don't have a control like cord. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've had experience with two of these products, Traxident and Exposil. And I'll just tell you, for single units, Exposil was just okay. I mean, mm -hmm. I felt like, you know, I trimmed my dyes for two years. All right? I mean, I'm that guy. You were that, that guy. guy. You were that guy. You know, so here's the thing. You know, when you're, when you're trimming your own dyes, you... <laughs> You really make some decisions real quick on what what you're going to use for tissue retraction. That's hardcore, man. Trimming and your own dyes. I just got yeah, say. I mean, I have my own pendant. Even I'm not that man. hardcore. So we knew why I did that. As a dentist told me, he said, "Wes, just just trim your own dyes for two years, and your preps will get better." You know, well, and they did. Yeah, I'm sure, that's true. It's true. I mean, it's really true. So trim your own dyes. Tip of the week, right there. <laughs> and if you, so I used Exposil, and I'll say what I say to John is that. It's not as good as double cord technique because it's not as consistent as double mm -hmm, cord. Mm -hmm. um, so the consistency of double cord or the predictability of double cord is just hands down, especially if you're doing multiple units in one arch. It just seems like I got better. Now, I'll tell you what I got with Exposil that I loved was drying. And, and yeah, the, yeah. the hemostatic quality of Exposil is unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, really good. But, but the downside of Exposil is the cost. For sure. It, it is unbelievable. 
and it's still expensive. I mean, the little glass ampules and then the little tips that are metal. Yeah. I don't yeah. think anything's changed in 15 years. And uh, the well, little Well, it's the gun, same with all these products. They're yeah, all expensive. They're very expensive. cheaper, but obviously it doesn't work as well. Yeah. You know, 3M's and, and got a new one out. Um, you know, Yeah, the called, 3M retraction. Yeah, yeah stringent yeah. retraction paste. I mean, I, I still, I still think that there are, for me, the use of these materials alone. Say Exposil, if I was going to pick a use for it, if I wanted to use it, I would say it would be for veneer cases, anterior yeah. veneer cases where I'm not. Equa gingiva prep. preps, e equa gingiva. Yeah, equa gingival preps. I'm but not. To be going honest with you, but the cost would, alone. Right. You I know? know. I mean, why not just use a, a small cord? Like a triple you know? O cord, you know? I mean, Which is what I do. I don't use these products anymore because I, I use just a small cord. It's cheap. It's easy. Now, I will say these products are pretty easy, too. Yeah. So I don't want to, I don't want to like bag on them too hard that they're, well, they're there's a reason products. why they sell. You know what Brad, Absolutely. the dental lab guy, told me? You know what he told me? He said he wishes that, I'm not going to mention the product name, but he's going to, he's going to wish that, one of these products was never invented. He said he <laughs> hates, detests it so much. Yeah. And he, and he said the number one problem that I see is tissue retraction and the ability for a dentist to do it. Yeah. And so it's interesting that he says that. I know what we want, and I know what Brad wants. Right. Brad, the dental lab guy, wants you to use double cord. It's one yeah, consistency. Yeah, he wants you to use double cord or a diode laser or electrosurge yeah. because of the consistency. And... I let's think talk that about this, let's talk about something else here because we're talking yeah. about impression retraction, right? Right, right. So what if we're using optical scanning, right? Right. Because right now, if I use a tissue retraction technique like I was taught to basically do, where you are deep down in the dark depths of the sulcus and you've got, you know, what you could see in one angle, like, oh, there's the space. And you inject Impra gum or Identium or some high quality impression material, that you have this hydraulic pushing of the impression material down into that sulcus that you create, and it displaces tissue. Right. Even the impression material does, if you have proper retraction. Okay. Now the difference, okay, with an optical scanner is that it has to be able to see right past you that. You There's can't no cheat. Cheating. So therefore, that's why I switched to a laser, okay? Yeah. But And John, you switched to electrosurge. Yeah, it was the same thing. I mean, I, I, I in the posterior part of the mouth when there's bleeding um, and you're subgingival, you're taking off old crappy PFMs. Mm -hmm. uh, if you tell me with an optical scanner <laughs> that you can get excellent results every time with cord, I will say it's hogwash. It's not true because no I... Way was There's a no cord way. master. I'm a cord master. Okay. And Ooh, I have used double Jedi cord. Knight. Yeah, man. I have used double are, cord are technique. You, are you like Indiana Jones with your cord, man? Oh You're yeah. Like, I come in there <laughs> with the with the premier nip pack and I'm just like shoo, shoo, shoo. and I just from like across the room and it's oh, already man. in the sulcus, man. It's already in the sulcus. I don't even have to like I just like tell a it what to do. Cinch on that thing. Yeah, I yeah. tell it what to do. I nod it as it's flying in the So oh, man. I I was so good I'm I felt like I was really good with cord. <laughs> And I got my scanner and I started having some problems with that. Yeah, because I remember you called me and you were like, dude, I'm going to electrosurge and buying one now. Yeah, well, I was like, I hate the scanner, right? Because Yeah, yeah you did. Deep, you actually said, I hate the scanner. Yeah, because these deep preps that I was always having no problems with were now presenting me with problems. And I, and I think stuff. that I think you just have to be aware of now. Don't get me wrong. For 90 percent of what mm. you do on a scanner, double cord is perfect. Oh, yeah. But for that 10% where it is sub G and it's hard to see, um, you just sometimes have to do something with to, to remove that little bit of, of a trough. So yeah, be aware okay, of that John. for optical scanning. Now let's talk about product of the week, Wes. Product of the week. It's, this it's... leads right into, if you're gonna use cord, Yes. What if is it? If you're going to use cord, what should you use, Wes? What are we lassoing our preps with today? That's right. Okay, because you we see have me tried over in the all. corner lassoing with some cord. We've tried them all, man. We've tried them all. And I'll tell yeah. you the other day, I told John this. I told him at the AFP meeting. I'm walking down and I'm like, John, it's like the other day I ran out of cord, my favorite cord, okay? Mm. And I picked up like this old cord that I had. Yep. And I was like, it's hmm, not the same. What did? 
Is this because the assistant handed it to me and they were like, "Yep, yeah, we're out of the uh, double zero and the, uh, the the brand that you like," and I'm like, "What? This is not packing like I want it to." Yeah, yeah <laughs> and so it's not good. the the product of the week happens to be Premier Knit Pack. Go and buy Premier Knit Pack, and yep. let me tell you right now, you will not for, you will not regret it. It is the way that it is knitted. And the way that yeah. it holds the hemostatic agent, it's the way yep. that it cuts. Listen, it has the most innovative cap system you've ever seen. Imagine yeah, cool. pulling out your cord and not having to use scissors. Yeah, it, it has, has a cutter a bl- built in. It has a cutter built in. Love and it. it's sharp every single time. It's kind of like having the plastic wrap with the little it's, cutter built in. It's unbelievable. You, just, you take off what you need. Your assistant doesn't take off, you know, 27 linear yards of yeah. cord for like a premolar. Hey, listen, it's you know? 100% cotton. It's wheat That's free. Good. Now, it's let me wheat. just tell you what I love. It's gluten-free about cord. What, <laughs> let me just tell you what I love about <laughs> Nitpack besides all the things Wes has said. And we're not being paid by Premier, by the way. No. Uh, although if they want to sponsor us, that'd be great. That's fine. But, um, but, <laughs> but we're not. We just love the product. But you know what I love is I love the triple zero oh, bring it. dot zero. The triple zero dot zero cord is my cord, man. That's the cord that if I have in my practice, I am lassoing every prep with it, man. And it is midnight green. That's the color <laughs> on the on the bottle. Midnight green. So I just like the. It's my favorite cord because when I use double cord technique, I want a small, small, small cord for my first cord. And a lot yeah. of times I used to like start off, I was using like zero. You got to get it down there. Double man. zero. But then I'd have a problem because what I like to use, I like to use triple zero dot zero and then a two from I'll my second I'll just say cord. this so about the so triple got, zero dot zero. No, yeah. car, no cord left behind. No cord <laughs> left behind. <laughs> yeah, man. So ask me I, how a, I know. Yeah. it's a, That's the only thing is you better make, that's why it's midnight green. That's ask why it's me midnight green because they, they, hope, they <laughs> hope you can find it. They want you to be able to find it. Because oh, if it was man. like orange or red or something, it would never be found. Oh, man. But yeah, I, I and I use I use triple zero dot zero for all of my class fives as my retraction. If I'm not using rubber dam isolation, so it, it just sinks down into even the thinnest tissue and the tiniest little sulcus. Uh, so I, I I think this product, you, it's worth a try Knit if you're used to some of the others pack. out there. It's it's just Get it. it's just the best. We both hey, listen, we both agree. A, we both use it. If you're not a user of Premier products, they are uh, you know quite the company, and yeah, uh, we got some we, good stuff. They have some really good stuff, but head on over to Premier and uh, Premier Dental and uh, check them out. Uh, The cord is definitely reasonably priced, and it will save you a lot of money versus buying these expensive retraction pay systems. Right. Now, if you want to use them, again, the bottom line, you want to use those retraction systems, use them appropriately. Yeah, some of them work. They could could work, but, But, but just be aware of the consistency issue. Be aware... That you know, this is not a panacea. It's not a fix-all. Wes, this has been a great episode. You know, because we we spent some time in our in our geeks corner. I really enjoyed that. Um, but we also got to just talk about really something that everybody deals with on a, on a yearly basis is fees. Um, if you guys are enjoying the show, and this show will be releasing a little bit after AO, so we know you're going to get be getting some of our AO stuff. If you're liking what you're hearing from us, I mean, we've been doing this a long time. We are having a lot of fun with it. it. Everything's been growing. We want you guys to continue to to tell us what you want more of. You know, we we really thrive on that feedback. If you have questions you want answered on the show, we've been doing more of that lately, Wes. We've been mm-hmm. talking about some of our questions that we're getting from our listeners, and that's been really fun. So if you want to do some, you want some shout outs, you know, to you, if you want a chance at that. Um, we're also working on putting together a, just a question answer show. That's something we've been kind of working on mm-hmm. for a while, but we got to have a yeah, what do you want to, what do you want to know? Yeah. So shoot, shoot some stuff to, to us about that and then connect with us on our social media. Mm-hmm. We want you to let us know what you think about us. We are on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're answering uh, those questions. A lot of times that people are putting up on Facebook and Twitter, we love to see your photos of some tough cases. And because we are uh, getting younger, we're now on Instagram. We're cool now, Wes. Do you remember that? We're cool. Cool thanks, kids. thanks again to Carson for hooking us up with that. Uh, we are now on Instagram, and we are uh, putting some cool stuff up there, trying to aspire to be like those D three sixty five guys, right? You know, we're Man. not quite as cool as they are, but we're trying. So love us up on Instagram, love us up on Facebook, 
and give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It goes a long way at letting yeah, to letting people difference. know. We really appreciate we all you guys listening to us, and uh, it's um, it's pretty awesome. And uh, we really want to know what you think, and we want to hear from you. And uh, hey, if you're going to be at one of these meetings coming up that we're going to be at, look us up. You'll see us. Don't be afraid. We're just regular dudes. Because right. for John, I'm Wes, and we are the Dental Guys. <laughs> <laughs>